Raise the window up and let the people all come out and listen, and they listen to him fight. <laughs> the thing that brought one of the best things that ever happened to the farm country was the CNL or REA, or Real Electrification Association, that brought Electricity Farm, which began to bring uh, equality to the farm. Most people in those days never went to school, never had the education of any kind. That was one of the best things to happen. Now, the sharecropper was supposed to furnish all labor to make his crop. The landlord would furnish the mules, the plows, the seed, and uh, anything else that was necessary for it, and the wagon to haul the cotton and crop to the When lay-by time came, that was in, usually in August, when they got the crop plowed out, chopped out, and the, mother, and the lot got left the middle, we call it. Then they would go to the woods and start cutting their winter wood for stove wood and winter wood for fires. Keep the whole house warm. By the way, in the houses, the people would take newspapers and tack it to the roof and to the walls to try to keep the wind from cutting through. You see it out here in these houses out here now. Two of them came from Pickett's Farm, one of them came from Johnny Poole Farm, which was a commissary, a shotgun house. Which meant if you open both, both the open front door and the back door, you could shoot a shotgun through it and it wouldn't get the thing. That's where it got the thing. The roads were so bad that people didn't have transportation, so they went to town either once a week or once a month. But to help out, there was such a thing called a, a rolling store. And I wish Orville, uh, uh, or what's his name, Joe West? Uh, Orland. Orland West would have been here because he actually drove a rolling store. What that did, he would bring out canned groceries and uh, sometimes cold drinks. He'd put ice in the thing and they'd have some cold drinks. And he'd bring out the necessary things he had to have, like flour, canned food, stuff like that. And uh, also, we had ice delivery in those days. That's where the ice box got its name, ice box, because they brought ice out. Ours used to come from Google at first, and it would come in a hundred pound, hundred pound uh, box. But it was marked off, you could take a screw, uh, screwdriver on uh, an ice pick and chip it off and break it off into 25, 50, or 75, 100 pounds. The trust in those days was so good that we never locked the doors, and you'd have a sign out there that had 25, 50, 75, 100 pounds on it, and you'd Mark which one you wanted, and he would come in, put the ice in the ice box, and leave. Now you can name another time he made that. I don't remember that. Uh, but I want to mention about trust. People believed in each other in those days. Uh, I heard my mother ask someday, my daddy one day, he said, "Do you think he's going to do it?" He said, "Honey, we shook on it. We shook hands on it. No contracts, and we shook hands." Another time I had him ask about it or something about that, and he said he gave me his word. Then the hands that I mentioned could not read or write, most of them. And when he would settle up with them in the fall, he'd write a check out for them. And when he took the pen, he'd write his name on the end of the check and keep the pen down. And he said, do you believe everything we've done? And he said, yes. He said, touch the pen. That was legal to those people. I've heard people say in the past, have you settled Mr. Fred? He said, yes, I touched the pen. Mm -hmm. So that was legal. That was for them. That was legal. Uh, mail. We used to get mail from Bloody. Mr. Bobby Bowles brought our mail out. And at 7 or 7.30, and sometime almost you set your clock on it, but Every morning he would be there at 7 or 7 30, five miles from Newman with a buggy, rain or shine. Today, the miles have been added to it. They deliver the car and we get 2 30 in the afternoon. There's a delivery man. Right there. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thing I have said that happened to the farm was the bring the REA. As time went on, we began to get water and lights and education. Today, they've got televisions, they've got GPS, they've got computers, they've got everything the city has. 
except uh, police protection. And they've got guns in the house for that. And, uh, uh, was the firemen. But the firemen most of the time will come out and help you. Now, when I was growing up, mules were the what, only meat power. We did have two steel wheel tractors that were 20 horsepower, and they had three gears. Slow, slow, and slow. <laughs> <laughs> you could outwalk the third gear. It was, it was a <laughs> I got off the school bus one day, and my daddy had a new farm all tractor out there. They had rubber tires on the road, the M farm all. I got on the track that went put in 50 years and started the house and they steered me there. It was fast. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he, he, would, he didn't believe in rubber tires, he didn't think, so he bought steel wheels to go with those tractors. And when wintertime came, we didn't have rice to paint tires, so the tractors were no good. So he got the idea to move the tires in, put steel wheels on them, and made the first dual wheel tractors, probably. I give him credit for being the first one that you'd have two wheels. I don't know whether we were or not. But that two wheel would help it go in the, in the mud. But the tractor was so weak that if you wanted to get it fifth gear, you had to get on the side of the road and let one of those wheels hang over the ditch. <laughs> and roll it just right, you shift it fast, it would pull up, maybe go in fifth gear. Uh, it was the first tractor that ever had any hydraulics on it. It would pick up the cultivator at the front and had the delay to pick it up in the rear. Today, the tractors have power steering, power brakes, air conditioning, radio, GPS, screens of all kinds in there, and it's so much better than it was before. Uh, as I said, he furnished the mules, which, and then the equipment, the turning plow, which turned the land over about 12 inches wide every time you get the whole 20 acres, 10 acres that way. Then you'd hair it off, smooth it off, and then you would take a middle buster, and throw half of it each way and make your rolls. So every roll, if it was 100 rolls in the field, you made 100 trips to make the rolls. Uh, then uh, he had the wagons and the planters and things. Now when we planted cotton, it was solid cotton. And you used gin run cotton seed. Go to the gym, catch your cotton, and go inside. I can't tell you about that. And catch your wag, catch your seed. In those days, there were only about two companies that made any kind of seed. One of them was the Elton Fine Land Company, Greenville, Mississippi. The other was Stonewall Cotton Company, out of Greenville, Mississippi. Delta Fine had Delta Fine 15, which raised, uh, when I grew up, we were raising Delta Fine 15 and when the, to, after the Second World War. And Stonewall Cotton. Uh, men would have to pick their cotton, they'd have to chop it, chop it out. It, sometimes it is what you call bar and all. Like this, <laughs> your roll of cotton, you take a turning plow and throw it this way and this way and leave it about four inches wide so it, the choppers have less trouble. Then you had to come back and dirty it and put the cotton back up there so it wouldn't fall off and then you had to plow it several times through the year. And they were supposed to pick the cotton. And they, they, they had to always chop your cotton twice and pick it twice. Uh, a picker could normally pick, I'm going to some pickers here in a minute, could normally pick about 100, 200 bales a day, uh, pounds a day. Mm -hmm. And it took 1,500 pounds of seed cotton to make a bale. And then you'd haul it by truck or trailer to the town. And when it gets to the gin, if he got there late, he might have to stay all night. And they'd sleep on top of that wagon, wait their turn to get. First gin was gin about one bale an hour. The last gin we had in Dumas was gin 60 bales an hour or one bale a minute. Mm -hmm. it shows you the progress that we made. By the way, Dumas will not have a cotton gin for the first time in my life that I can remember. I think there's only two that you shake out. Uh, the gin and the back gate. Winchester. Winchester. Uh, Winchester. And Winchester. Brew County. Yeah. 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 At what time do we set five? Five operations on time.
when the, when the pigs are of cotton, they carry it to the gin and wait to get what they call the seed money off the cotton. A lot of times the seed was worth more than the cotton. And I have seen a check for $50 coming out of a seed at one time, a seed. And Daddy would let them get the first seed check because that would give them cash money to spend. He'd always get his money out of what was there. But they'd always then bring money back to them. World War II came along, and the advancements up to that time had been steel wheel tractors, uh, rubber tire tractors. The first, the best thing that ever happened was a steam engine that gave us power and that cotton gin, which had to get going. The advancements came after the Second World War. I believe it or not, we were all in the, still in the uh, recession. Depression. Depression, thank you, sir, at that time. But when we came back from World War II, we had what they call the GI Bill of Rights. A lot of men went to the service and came, became the greatest generation that Tom Brokaw talked about. They got an education and then we began to expand. Steel wheels became rubber tires, improving tractors. I've mentioned about how good they were, big they are now. Farm chemicals. Back in my day, early start, there was no farm chemicals whatsoever. There was a hole. And the one thing we fought for was the army worm and used calcium arsenic. You had to do that at night after the dew came, so you blow it out. They had a blower that would blow it out on it. Modernization, oh, the first uh, good farm chemical came along was Carmex from DuPont. It cost so much that we tried to make a 12 inch band to save money on it. It, it controlled most weeds and most grass. The next good one that came along was trap land or trifurus from Eli Lilly. You had to broadcast it, work it in the ground, and it kept, it got almost every bit of grass. Modern nation of, of equipment came from, uh, one of us mentioned a while ago that they used to have binders to bind your oats and stuff that you had, and uh, they were used to have five foot header on it and pulled by a tractor with a PTO. Today, they've got, on our farm, we've got one combine that has a 35 foot header. It takes 12 rows of uh, soybeans at one time. I used to make the statement when the combines were smaller that they make three rounds and a through it, I'd be through it by crop. But I'd make it down about one round and through it now. <laughs> then they cover so much ground so fast. Uh, cotton pickers went from cotton picking to a one row picker. In 1946, my dad came to high school, got me out of school, took me down to Dickens to see the first one row picker that I'd ever seen in my life. We looked at it and said, man, that thing will never go. It was trash. He dropped cotton on the ground. And it covered I mean, it was a lot better than pickers, maybe, but uh, they've gone to six row pickers now. Uh, in 1950, late, about early 50s, rice came across the river, came to County. And that was one of the best things that happened to us because we had a lot of buckshot ground that was not ever good for anything else. You couldn't raise cotton, you couldn't raise corn, you couldn't raise hay on it to speak of. And when they came, well, you had to have a well. So we started putting down wells about 120 feet deep. Today, there are 2,500 wells in the shape County. Think about them pumping all at one time, how much water's coming out of the ground. We used to have 10 inch wells that pump two to 3,000 gallons a minute. Now, all of them are not that big, but they pump a lot of water out of the ground. When, when they came here, we didn't have a whole lot of land that was left, so we started clearing timber land. We had a lot of timber land, most of it was in the shot. Then tractors came in, Caterpillar tractors put a, what they call a bee blade on the front, and it would go along and cut the ground, up these trees off the ground. You take a tree that big, it just cuts right off to it and cut it off the ground. With that, after that came land leveling, which started bringing where we could irrigate. We decided we could start irrigating. We could irrigate the rice, but the levees might run for all crazy. Now they got some of them that were straight level the land, make straight levees. And then before that, we had to have drainage. Or after that, we had to have, so we had drag lines, and those days, they got hydraulics back over. 
And one of the best things on irrigation that was ever made for us was what we call, pardon the expression, gut bite. You see a lot of it lying up here on where the old place was. That we used to use the, the six inch irrigation pipe, but the friction would build up so high in the form of a mile you could hardly go any further. But now you can just go continuously with this 15 and 18 inch pipe used one time a year. By the way, combines are used on rice, not, uh, soybeans, wheat, milo, uh, maybe some other thing. Corn. Corn. Cotton pickers use one thing. Forty-five days a year, approximately. Mm -hmm. So you see the expense of mm -hmm. the education that came along help farmers with the, from the extension service and the universities and things. The extension service starts teaching us how to farm rice. They teach us when to fertilize. They have a time it when to bring start food. You have to fertilize your rice with less time. They taught us that. When I first started out, it was 4-H. Mr. Leo Wiley used to come up and feed once a month at school, and he used to teach us about something. I don't remember what. But <laughs> as a home extension agent, he'd go out and teach the ladies how to quilt and to can and things like that, can the food. But It didn't take. Freezing <laughs> 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 was a lot easier. <laughs> But the extension service really was thing. And then the seed companies came in. Like I said, there was only Delta Pine or Stone. And now there are about eight companies in the United States. And more than that, we were a lot of little small companies. Well, about eight companies now, six of them, maybe, that produce seed. And Delta Pine has got a new variety every year now. And you start out 15 years ago, you make a selection, and then you go along and uh, select after eight years, and then you bring it out. Now they got one every year. Education things happen. Insecticides, when we start using them, with DDT was the first thing after the Second World War came along. And man, we thought it was something you spray DDT out. All the mosquitoes, all the flies, and all the right. like that. And it was wonderful. <laughs> we, I heard them when I went to school, they were Aldrin and Dealrin. I mean, they said Dealrin was one, and then there was Edrin. I bought in 50 gallon drums. I buy three, four, five of them at one time and take them to the airplane and put them out in a day. And it would cover just a few acres. Now they've got boxes with ounces in it. And you take an ounce to an acre or something like that. So it's they really yeah, we didn't have any fungicides for our seed, stuff like that. Uh, seed treatments. And then we didn't have any really fertilizer. We had uh, chilean nitrate of soda. All the way to Chile. That's about the only part we had. Advancements in machinery and everything else. We have images from space now. We take pictures from space and they can actually count how many bushels of oranges are on an orange tree from space. They've got uh, maps that show you every bit of your farm, every ditch, every tree. And I saw a thing on, tele on my internet the other day that they showed us. School, I mean, a city, and the street was full of people. And you press a button, you go down, you go down, and you go down, and you pick out one face. You go from the top building, you go down this way and pick out a face this way. Don't ask me it. But you, you can't hide, they said, from the government. You're in the crowd. Combines went from the uh, binders, five feet wide, the combines to split up 12 rows. We have, first thing we thought we had to do good was put radios in our uh, shortwave radios in our uh, trackers and things. But now they're obviously everybody's got a tel telephone. Call them down telephone is where it is. GPS, GPS, GPS and that thing. And then they've got automatic steering now. If you've got it, you can get a signal come in and start your tractor. And you're taking six rows to go out in the field. When you turn, you go over 100 yards somewhere and hit that button, and it comes right back. When you come back, it'll hit exactly right. They're perfectly straight. No guesswork. Really <coughs> My mother lived to be in her 90s, and she born in 1898. She thought she'd seen everything that had ever been done. Everything except the telegraph 
and the railroad. And after that, there were airplanes, there were cars, there were telephones, radios, television, and a man on the moon in her lifetime. And now these computers, because I saw one thing the other day on a computer, talking about new computers, and you wanted you to take a pencil about this size, and it have tegabytes in it. Not the gigabytes, but tegabytes in it. And you put it down, take it apart, put it down. On the wall, there will be a screen, like, like what your screen is. And you can type on it, and it will work. Don't edit it out. Uh, <laughs> I talked to some men one day, and they were talking about how good things were going on the farm. And they asked me, said, do you want to get back in the farm? Do you miss it? I said, I sure do. I'm thinking about getting back in it. I want to buy two of these cotton pickers and make them bail in a row. It cost $670,000 a piece. I want to get two combines that cost $550,000 a piece. And I want to get six, eight tractors that cost $200,000 or more a piece. Then I'll start thinking about the equipment I need. <laughs> so I really want to get back in the But I want to show you some pictures. Mr. Jones is really smiling today. <laughs> 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 People around the world are desperate for food. Here's this picture of a hillside. The made, handmade levees and everything, and where they pump the water from, I don't know, but we think we got it hard. Uh, Seed companies put out test plots. That's another thing that educates us. There's a competitive seed seed business. Now here are things in the pipeline. This is a uh, soybean. This is the next two, two or three years. They think they're going to make improvements. What they what they plan on every year. This is in corn. What they're going to do in the next three years. That goes from drought resistance to nematode resistance to uh, in, insect resistance to, uh, uh, oh, it's, it's just too many things there to read about. Here's what I was talking about the companies that have, these companies that have been in it, these companies that own them now, buy. And this morning, they cross the river just sold this past year. Here's a tractor that's got 640, uh, 560 horsepower in it. Three tires in the front, three tires over here, three tires, in, 12 tires. That is a John Deere. That is a John Deere. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they can pull a huge piece of equipment. Uh, I'm found here on population. I want to say about that. Oh, we, we poised the cotton now. You can have up to a 140 foot boom on the sprayer. We use kind of airplanes, all right, but you can't have a 140 foot sprayer. Uh, what I'm going to find, I mean, I can't, I've got it all mixed up here now, but what I wanted to say was that in 1950, there were 25 million people on the American farm. And 10 years after that, down to, as I said, 25, it's down to 15 million. There were 5 million farms. It's down, it's lost 2 million farms. That was in 1950. What I'm saying is, it's leading up to, uh, in the future, there's going to be corporation, cooperative farming. Nobody can spend that kind of money. You can't just go out, work your way up, and start buying all this equipment. You either got to grow in you know, inherited or be a corporate farmer. This tractor that I just showed you has 16 Ford power chip gears. I mentioned that three, three horn, three axes. You can actually get uh, 24 if you want. But they got some of those slower, slower, slower things. Uh, here's, here's some pictures I'd like to show you. This is how cotton was plowed. That's called center burning cotton. And he went down one row, came back the other. That's why you only raised 10 acres of cotton. <laughs> now, 
Times were hard back in the Depression. This is a picture of Joy right here. When you can tell me you were going to do that. It's not. It's not. <laughs> he won't get no he won't get no supper, will he? <laughs> we, we never went hungry here. But these people are hungry. We didn't have any money, but we we, we survived. Look look at what expression on this one. These pictures were taken in 1930, 35. And here's one that's heartbreaking too. Here's a man with his children and his wife. Waiting on trying to catch a railroad somewhere to go. Hold it, look for a job. Living in a shack like that. And here's a man with a bucket trying to water corn to make some crop out of this drought. We water, you know, just pour the extra water, let it run out the end, and we don't worry about it. Uh, this was the calendar that Mayor put out a few years ago. This is what a gin lot looked like. Big bales. Notice they got their cut right there at the top. That's where they took the sample out, what they used to sell. This is what a bale looked like. This is three or four bales right there today. The gin compress, these used to go to a compress and go and be squeezed by power, steam power. The gins do it for hydraulic now. Here's
we broke land, and in the hill country, you built terraces. So with that tractor, we broke the land and we built terraces. But the cultivation still went on with mules. We still planted and cultivated with mules. We were a cotton and corn farm. We grew cotton in the hills. We grew the corn to feed the livestock. We had a bad year and it was dry. We weren't going to make much corn. We planted oats in the fall. Then in the spring, after the corn had run out, we went to the crop year. We'd go out before the oats were mature and cut a little each day to keep the livestock going. Then when it got mature enough, we would cut it just like we would hay. We didn't have a baler. We just put it on the wagon and took it to the barn. But we didn't plant oats every year. It was just those years that before it had been dry that we didn't have enough corn. In 1945, my senior year in high school, and I planted my first jack cotton crop, mine. <laughs> the hands came down from the farm and had me break it and plant it. Well, that was good. But I cultivated my first crop of the saddle horse. Now that's interesting. <laughs> I rode him for pleasure, and then when I got ready to fly, I had him. And believe it or not, the horse, somebody had had it before me, had broken it well. And when I got lost flying it, he kept it straight. Prince was talking about Centerbury, but in the hills, we had to go by and we had to, we'd plow a little bit closer over here and over here, and then we'd come running right <coughs> the middle out again. So that meant three trips up that one middle. We weren't as fast as Joe. <laughs> and that year, I got a real view of cultivating crops and insect control. Calcium, calcium arsenic was all I had for bow weevil and worm control. If you've never had the opportunity or the pleasure, when the dew is heavy on cotton, take a cotton sack with cow I mean, a flour sack with calcium arsenic and go down the middle shaking that, <laughs> get it on your wet clothes, and then you have a rash on you because of where that is, but it got rid of the weevils and the worms for a short time. In the fall of 45, it was time for me to go to college. <clears throat> And we decided to plant the farm in pine trees. And so we got them planted. I set off to conquer the world for going to college. I wanted to study medicine because that's what my father had been. But I was told that my eyes weren't good enough to study medicine. So I finished college with a math science degree, but I still had farming in my blood. I probably would have done better as a veterinarian <laughs> in 1952, I started planting cotton, corn, and a dairy farm in Morehouse Parish, Louisiana. You all know where that is, just south of the border. I also taught school. I taught school so I could farm, I farmed so I could teach school. <laughs> one of them to live. <laughs> Everything now was mechanical farming compared to what I'd grown up with. Uh, except for picking cotton. We were kind of behind the times down there. In 52, we were still using hand labor to pick our cotton. Everything else now was mechanized farming. We use farm all tractors, excuse me, Ken, I know that's a bad term, and you don't use that term farm all anymore, but that was what it was called then, was our equipment. Cultivators still had the arm power to get the cultivators up. Uh, but you know, the bow weaver was still a problem down there in the flat We had a more power than our equipment I'd ever had. We had a John Deere hay baler. 
that had its own power unit on it, I believe it was the Wisconsin engine. And we had what we called a thrashing machine, but it was a small combine that was pulled by a tractor. And you had to ride it and fill up sacks with the grain. And after you got through late in the afternoon, you had to go back, pick up all the sacks, take them in. Then the first thing each morning, you had to empty those sacks so you could use them over again to work that day. Wasn't much labor involved. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped teaching school in 1968. I saw something that just fascinated me beyond all my dream was a centripetal irrigation system. So along with my farming, I went into selling and to installing irrigation systems. First year was good. I sold the biggest one that had ever been sold. It do a section of land in one circle. The last one I ever sold. It rained for three years. <laughs> and at the end of those three years, I had lost my shirt. I knew that time. <laughs> but at that time, after losing my shirt, I moved to Pickens, Arkansas, as a farm manager of R.A. Pickens. It was, uh, the equipment was larger. I had 40, 20 tractors, six row equipment, Big combine, two row cotton pickers. I thought I died and don't live. <laughs> <clears throat> I saw a different side of farming though that I'd never seen before. Fur irrigation. How in the world they made land level enough from where I'd grown up that you could run water down the middle. I just couldn't imagine that. Even with putting it to grade, I figured you'd if you took the hill off here, you had only clay here and too much topsoil down here, but it worked out well. I realized something about cotton, even more so, that I had been watching for years. You go to a cotton field and you look at it each day, it's different. Each day is a different day. And cotton looks a little different. Part in this field may look different, part in this field. But one of the things that you need to learn to know if you're doing cotton, cotton will tell you what it needs. All you have to do is understand what it's trying to say. And that's the hardest part of it, is ever understanding what it's telling you. But it tells you when it needs water, it tells you when it needs more fertilizer, it tells you when it needs side and it sure tells you when morning glories have gotten too big. <laughs> then I got to be a rice farmer. I moved up here and Mr. Pickett said, Jack, what do you know about rice? I said, the only thing I know, don't stir it while cooking. <laughs> well, he said, that's great. I'll teach you what you need to know, and you won't have any bad habits to unlearn. <laughs> so in 1985, we were still having polio problems. Those of you that are farmed on biopathology, you know that bow weevils showed up at least two or three weeks earlier than they did on people up here on 65. You'd already spent $100 an acre before these people started falling. So I started seeing articles in news uh, magazine, farm magazines, about bow weevil eradication. Mm. They were doing it out in the far west, California, Arizona, and the southeast was well along the way. And the changes that had made in their agriculture was amazing. So I got really interested in it. And in 1991, uh, what do you look for anyhow, but uh, it's 85. A resolution from Arkansas Farm Bureau of DeShea County Farm Bureau went into the annual meeting asking Farm Bureau to support low eradication. It passed. 
Farm Bureau. And they formed a study committee made up of cotton farmers across the cotton belt of Arkansas, from the southwest all the way across up to the northeast. They would be surprised at how much cotton was grown in the central part of, part of Arkansas only a few years before this. <coughs> but with this, we went to the legislature, get a bold legal eradication. And thanks to a lot of hard work by Miss Charlotte, that passed. Wow. We got it. We had bold legal eradication in the state. And we started that in 91. There was a lot of hard times, <laughs> hurt feelings, lost tempers, everything else. <laughs> but it worked. The old rule about poisoning cotton was wait until you had a 20% infestation of Punkin Square. Now today, that 20% goes to the cotton seed. You know, when I started my first farming, you pick the cotton, you put it in a trailer or a wagon, you went to the gin, and you became a gin hand with that load of cotton. You sucked the cotton off the trailer, you see. They didn't have anybody to do it. But when I quit farming, you had cotton pickers, module builders, Maju hogs, Maju feeders at the gym. It was untouched by human hands, except what you wasted on the ground that you had to pick up when you done. I started farming with one horsepower and ended up with 400 horsepower. I started with hand picking and then sucking off the cotton at the gym. I ended my farming career with four row pickers, Maju builders, module feeders again. Equipment has become much larger since then, much more sophisticated than what we had in those days. But each year brings improvement. Mm -hmm. I started with calcium arsenic for bow weevil and worm control. Now the bow weevil has been eradicated from Arkansas for five years. No bow weevil has been found. I feel blessed to have had the opportunity to move to D.C. County and to be uh, part of the changing time in agriculture. Thank you. Such a hard time about well you know you, you 
you not do with your crop yet? You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. You know, why do you need this money? And all of a sudden, looked up to the other brother and said, what do you want? He said, well, I'd want to borrow $100, too, but if you're so broke, I'll go see Mr. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> also mentioned the different companies. He mentioned the seed companies and however many seed companies there were and now there are only five. The same thing is true in the equipment industry and I think that's why Miss Charlotte called me a little bit to talk about the equipment side. But he mentioned Farmall. Well Farmall became International Harvester that became Case, Case IH, and now has become Case New Holland. Uh, there, there are lots and lots of other manufacturers. Uh, Gleaner became hooked up with Agco, uh, White with Agco. Uh, ironically, John Deere is the only company that started out as John Deere that is still John Deere today. And I, I still don't understand that, but, but we, we are. We, we have stayed the, the same name through all the years since 1837. Um, which, you know, you talk about the equipment and each one of these gentlemen have their own idea about um, maybe what was the most improvement to agriculture. And I asked this question to, to some of our customers in the last week. And what I really realized was that the improvements to agriculture to each and every person seems to be generational. What, what Rich remembers for him as an improvement is a whole lot different than what it is to dig today, which is different than what it might be to myself or someone of my generation. But all in all, one of the largest improvements, or the greatest improvement, uh, was probably uh, the module building. Uh, you were, everybody's running the, the trucks with the, with the flatbed with cotton or cotton trailers, and you had to manage those. Module builder could sit there in the field and build a, a module or a loaf of bread that looked like it would, that would hold about 12 to 14, 15 bales of cotton, of, lint, of seed, seed cotton. And then Rich mentions the gut pipe. Well, I had a customer this week tell me, he said, you know, to him it was the gut pipe. And it was, he said, you know, I started farming and, you know, I, I maybe, have, maybe had a half a quarter mile of pipe. And I, after that first year of moving that pipe all over, I swore I was going to have enough pipe to lay it down and leave it all year long. He said, by the time I've got enough pipe bought to cover everything I farm, gut pipe showed up and I sent it all to Livingston. <laughs> so, but the gut pipe did. That along with the irrigation you mentioned and the drainage, otherwise this area would probably be as arid as West Texas is. Um, irrigation wells, as he talked about, give you an example, two years ago, I had a customer come in to tell us that uh, he was running his irrigation wells 24 hours a day, and it was costing $16,000 every 24 hours. And that goes on for seven, 10 days, 14 days in a row. So to get, we've got it, but it is expensive. But without it, we, would, we just wouldn't have it. But you can't it. control it when it's not raining. That's true. And you can't cut it off when it is. <laughs> that is true. I, I always, growing up, I always heard uh, Mr. R.A. Pickett say he was going to be wet on the 4th of July. And it would either be by rain or it would be by irrigation. But, but he was wet on the 4th of July. But there have been a lot of changes. Uh, Fritz also mentioned, uh, or Jack mentioned, the bow weave eradication. But think about BT Cotton, the bow worm. Uh, customer again this week, I asked, he said, yeah, you go to Without BT cotton, you go to bed at night wondering if you'd have a cotton crop the next morning. Um, so it's, you know, everything changes. It appears to be generational in my, in my opinion. A little bit from the equipment perspective, um, I, I can remember when I came home in 1976 and joined my dad in business, uh, I think cab tractors, manufacturer cab tractors were just out in, I think, in 1974 was probably the first. And I was trying to sell cab tractors, and I wasn't getting much, any takers. But I got to think, I looked at it, and a cab tractor, the cab itself was an additional $3,500 to a tractor. A tractor in 1976 was about 
today that same horsepower tractor is well over $200,000. Uh, but a cab, in, in 1976, I broke it down, and I would ask Michael, did he want to sit in a cab tractor for 50 cents a day? And that's what I calculated out over the life, or the depreciated lifespan of the tractor was 50 cents a day, which wasn't a hard sale. $3,500 was a hard sale. Um, talking about the uh, pickers from one row, two row, four row, six row, uh, 1976, a two row cotton picker was about $19,000. Rich mentioned today a, a, a six row John Deere on board moduling, and our competitor case is about the same way. Uh, you're looking at somewhere in you know, $675,000. Um, that picker in 1976, four row, or when the four-row picker came out, uh, we were, figured about 750 acres per picker. Back then we picked it twice, scrapped it. Today, this new module picker, uh, the first ones in the Shea County were Jim Bull Picker. What? What week? Two weeks? Monday. Monday. Uh, about 2,000 acres per picker. And there, it only takes two people in the field to operate. I mean, yeah, you still have to have somebody to clean up, but as far as that goes, that picker will pick the cotton and wrap it and drop, drop, drop it on the end of the road, and then somebody comes and picks it up, puts it on the trailer, and takes it to the gin. That's, that's the only time you handle it. Um, Revolutionary and our competitor has the same thing. Uh, you know, part of the program was 500 horse, you know, mules to 500 horsepower and GPS. That's probably where the bulk of what I'm going to say today is, is in the technology and the, the global positioning system. Uh, came on the scene about uh, five years ago. Uh, we all know about GPS and we've got our in our cars and. and but we've had it in, in, in the, in the uh, ag industry for probably about four or five years. When Chris was talking about auto steer, uh, you've got about three choices in, in what we call uh, auto steer, and that would be uh, SF1, uh, SF2, and RTK. SF1 would give you about, uh, it's a free from the government signal, and it gives you about a 13 inch variance. You're going to be, you'll have a true line within 13 inches. The SF2 is a, another, is a subscription uh, that you can buy from the government signal, and it'll get you down to about four inches of accuracy. And then the RTK is a um, local signal that uh, you can either have your own equipment, or in our case, in our business, uh, we built a, a that power network system, we can cover the entire Deshea County, and that gets you down to sub-inch. Less than one inch accuracy. Um, there again, that's a John Deere system that we have, but all the competitors have it, and then there are other third parties that are in the business as well. With that, you get the uh, ability to do prescription application. Uh, Fritz talked about or Jack talked about the uh, satellite imagery. We started with a company called End Time several years ago that would take aerial photos, take those, uh, take that data, and then they would interpret what they saw in, in the color photography, and then we would write a prescription about how the chemical was to be put out across the field, whether it was more in one area or less than another. And we'd write a, a computer prescription, put it in the high cycle sprayer, and even got into some of the uh, ag planes as well to minimize the amount of money that was spent to put out chemicals so you just didn't put one rate against over the entire field. Um, then the GPS or the precision ag technology is taken in on the data collection. Uh, all year long, you can, uh, a farmer can retrieve the data about his, how much seed population he put out where he sprayed his chemicals in the field, and then at the end of the year during harvest, he can collect the harvest data, and either he or somebody else can manipulate that throughout the, before the next crop and determine changes that might need to be made, whether it be 
um, improvements in some drainage or improvements in um, land leveling or something that would show them a, uh, a higher yield in certain areas of the field without having to, to uh, do something to the entire acreage at, at one time. Now we move into the management. Ken, let me yeah. stop you for a second. I need to change the tape. Your tractors used to sound like. Okay. Okay. Papa John. Uh, you know, from the management, another part of the management side of technology uh, is the ability today for the tractor to interact with other tractors or the tractor to interact with the service department. Um, We've got a product called JD Link that uh, if, your, if your tractor is having a service issue, it can send a text message or an email to our service department and uh, it would tell Leon that his new tractor is uh, low on oil or his new tractor is uh, about to have an air filter to plug up and it's, that's here today. Uh, the other thing Chris talked about, uh, again on the, on the technology side of, 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 the, of the equipment, uh, and I think this is the same little magazine that you held up long ago, but John Deere has a product called FarmSite. And what it allows to do is the farmer can sit in his truck or in his office and he can see the same thing going on the screen that the tractor driver's got. Uh, in a harvest situation, uh, the combine driver can control the speed and the position of a grain cart running next to it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, what is it, uh, Big Brother's watching. So it, <laughs> yes. Chris <laughs> uh, talked about communication, he talked about radios. Uh, today, in farming, we've gone from no communication at all on the farm other than just getting in a truck or a horse and running and finding somebody and telling them what to do, to CB radios, to business band radios, to uh, uh, phone patches in, in the radio system, to cell phones, to Oops. smartphones. <laughs> and the, the, the interesting part about the management side in smartphones is a farmer today can look at real-time weather. He has access to real-time markets. So rather than a market running up, and I can think of maybe several years ago when cotton ran up to a dollar, not this past year, but a little bit, several years ago when it ran up to a dollar, it, it ran up over a period of a few hours. And you know there were farmers that were able to, to capture that because they had access to a smartphone and knew it was going to happen or, or was watching it happen and retrieving that. So you know that's. From a management standpoint, technology and of the smartphone has been a tremendous um, improvement in, in management and marketing for our, for our farmers today. Um, I guess the last thing I, I would talk about in the, in, in the equipment side of it is no different than the farming. Um, when Fritz talked about corporate farming, and that's consolidation. Um, you, today we have consolidation of the farmers. There are fewer farmers farming more acres, uh, that's going to continue uh, from the equipment industry. Our customer base is dwindled due to that. Um, so you're seeing consolidation in the equipment dealer structure. Um, I was fortunate to be able to be a fourth generation equipment dealer. In uh, March, my brother and I decided that we would join forces with the neighboring dealer and sell out and become an employee. And this is the uh, nature of the industry. Uh, is it, was it the right decision? It probably was when we look back on it. Was it a hard one? It certainly was to be a fourth generation. There are not many fourth generations left in this industry. Uh, but you know, to be a part of it and continue in the industry is something that we were looking for. Uh, it had to, in our case, it had to, it had to be right for our family. It had to be right for our employees. It had to be right for our customers. And we think we chose that uh, with, the, with the Pew family that has a 60-year relationship with our family.
But that's the times that we're in. It's consolidation. It will continue. Uh, we've seen it in the manufacturer side. We've seen it in the dealer side. When we're, of course, seeing it in the farmer side. Um, Chris mentioned the, the corporate farming, but I don't know that we will be true corporate farmers. We're still family farmers, and we look like corporate farmers because when we think of corporate farming, we're thinking, okay, somebody's farming 10,000 acres. We've got a lot of customers today that farm 10,000 plus. Um, and they're family farmers. It's a father, son, two brothers, or whatever. But in our part of the world, that's still a family farm. It's not 160 acres and a mule as Senator Grassley would like to think it is. <laughs> but to us and to those people, that is a family farm and it will continue to be that. Thank you. Ken said he was marking things off his list, but Rich already covered them. You can imagine following this screen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was born uh, in 1943 and uh, uh, born out east of Winchester and still live pretty close to where I uh, grew up. My dad came home from World War II and began farming. Uh, and like many of you, maybe especially Gene, I chopped cotton and picked cotton by hand. And was very good at it, and I didn't really like it. But, uh, you know, that was part of growing up on the farm. And there were things about uh, growing up on the farm that I liked. And Papa Jean, too. Helen. Maybe some more of you. Uh, one thing I enjoy doing is when we pick cotton, Daddy would let me ride on top of the cotton from the trailer to the gym. That was a big thrill. <laughs> Back in those days, there were very few chemicals. Uh, we had to do most, you know, we hold everything. And uh, 1960, uh, I was in the 11th grade, and I was looking through a magazine one day, and I saw a set of scrapers. Uh, and uh, look at those scrapers. They were designed where they would slice the grass off next to the uh, road. And then there was another set that would pull it back. And I told Daddy in the vine, I was, uh, was I, you know, I didn't like to chop cotton. And the more grass we could get rid of, the less I had to hold. And so he did. And he had a tractor at that time. I think it was a WD 45 pound tower. The seat set off to one side, except directly over the road. The most uncomfortable thing you'd ever want to ride on. Awkward. But you could watch that road. And you could just almost scrape the sides of the cotton and peel that grass back, and it's a whole lot less work. Of course, back then, all we had two, we had two rows of equipment, you know. Uh, but uh, one of the stories I remember was uh, I don't remember exactly what year it was in the 50s. Some of y'all might remember we had a real wet June. It rained and rained and rained, and the grass got taller than the cotton. And Y'all know what? Well, you just couldn't hardly get a cultivator through the field. Uh, you'd go a few feet, and the grass would just ball up on there, and you'd have to get off, clean it off. Had a neighbor, Ralph Acock, that had a small riding mower. He actually took that riding lawnmower and mowed the middles on the 20 acre field. I don't know whether he mowed every row or not, but he, he mowed the grass down real short, and he was able to, uh, after the grass dried out, he could get the cultivator through that cloud there. <laughs> Farmers have a way of making things work. You remember that, Gene? Something. I don't remember Ralph doing that, but I remember the, we used to call it the disc hillers. I don't know yeah. that's not what it was called. Yeah. yeah. Well, they had disc hillers, but these were little uh, different. These were just, just scrapers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and another thing, uh, because we had small equipment, and uh, well, we had narrow turning roads, and one well, cotton picker came into this country. Of course, it didn't have fire steering on it, and you couldn't turn it back into the road straight. You'd always run over some cotton on the ends. Well, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but my daddy didn't want to waste any cotton. <laughs> so somebody had to pick the end of cotton off, that cotton off. So when I got into school, I had the privilege of doing that on the weekends. Uh, <laughs> my dad, my uncle, and myself, uh, 
drill, our first irrigation drill. Mm -hmm. uh, we did it by hand. We put down four two-inch pipes to hook the pump to it, and that was uh, where the water part of the farm, a few acres. But we didn't have loom pipes, we didn't have poly pipes. Uh, we dug a, a ditch, took a tractor and a blade and cut a ditch to the field. And then uh, uh, we would have a little furrow on the side, and we would run the water down through there uh, to water the cotton. Well, as you can guess, you know, the soil would wash away, and all the water would be going down one road. Uh, we had to, somebody just about had to stay in the field 24 hours a day uh, to kind of regulate the water and keep things from washing out. Of course, you know, I kind of like to get out there and wait around in the water being a kid. <laughs> so it wasn't too bad for me. You know, when we did that, uh, we didn't have a uh, big source of water. By the time we got across the field, uh, where we had started was already getting dry, but uh, Still, our yields went up dramatically because we didn't have the water. Our first combine I remember on the farm was a pull type. We had to pull it behind another tractor. Of course, it had little narrow wheels on it, and when it got wet, it wouldn't go. And uh, back in those days, we didn't have these shorter season varieties uh, that we have now. Uh, you know, if you drive around the countryside now, you see a lot of fields that have already been harvested, uh, the ground's worked up. Well, back in, uh, in my younger days, uh, the crop was still green when we had the longer season. And in fact, uh, I remember my daddy always hoped to get through for Thanksgiving. Now, you know, it'll be, it won't be long. A lot of people are going to be finished. But anyway, when I was getting into the field late and getting through late, it was usually wet. And this combine wouldn't go. That you couldn't put it when they got too wet. And one year we had a little small field that we just couldn't, just couldn't get through there. And it was pretty good soybeans. So uh, the beans got dry enough uh, that we, they would shatter out, uh, but yet the ground was too wet to uh, pull that combine. So Daddy got the great idea to hook this little Ford tractor to a trailer. We could pull it to the field. So he and I went out and actually snapped these beans off the ground and pulled them up any way we could get them. Carried, it, carried them back to the shed and threw them into the combine by hand. And uh, wasn't much labor in that either. <laughs> <laughs> but what I remember about it, even though it was work, uh, that extra money uh, came in pretty handy for Christmas. That was our Christmas spending money. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1961, and because of all the hard work I'd done on the farm, I thought that's got to be a better way to do it. So, uh, after college and working in private sector for 15 years, uh, I decided I wanted to get back into it. Of course, my daddy tried to talk me out of it. Actually, I wasn't listening. <laughs> But, I, you know, my mind was made up. So in 1976, I gave up the security of a, a regular paycheck with benefits and took a big gamble and got into farming. There's been a lot of changes taking place since then. Uh, I failed to mention I learned how to drive on a Ford tractor. With Ford Jubilee, we still have it out, out on the farm. The changes uh, that taking place, that little Ford tractor, it's dwarfed by the size of the tractor now. It shows you a picture. I think you can probably hide this four tractor behind the wheel of one of these large pieces of equipment. The only other day is picking cotton by hand, as I mentioned. Thank goodness. I dare say that one of these modern pickers today can pick as much cotton in one day's time as a uh, average small farm back in the day that I was a kid on the farm. You know, we did everything by hand back in those days. And so, so, you know, just, sometimes you're limited 
to the amount of acres you farm by the amount of labor you have. Another change, you know, I mentioned that we ran the water down the fur uh, <coughs> the deer gate. <coughs> now most everything is precision level. Uh, we have uh, wells everywhere, we have underground pipe, and as uh, mentioned, uh, all you have to do is hook your potty pipe onto the end of the advisor, you roll it out, the guy, uh, you turn the well on, the guy walks on, puts some holes in it, and uh, uh, it uh, pretty well all gets out at the end of the road at about the same time, and uh, it's just there's not much labor involved. Uh, after we started uh, using uh, aluminum pipe, someone mentioned you know, nobody had enough. And you had to keep moving the pipe. And you could go out there in the middle of the day to pick that aluminum pipe up with that sun shining on it, and it would burn your hands. It was hot. And in some cases, uh, we relived it out of the bowel. Well, no one wanted to be the short guy on the end of the pipe because if you ever done it, re out of a bowel, you're going to have fish, frogs, everything. <laughs> and it's going to be smelly. And I was have to be tall enough to, you know, I was trying to take the pipe of it, and water would run out from the guy behind me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and that's one of the things that I, I think is uh, one of the most beneficial uh, things we have now is, is that potty pipe. Because we're able to get across the field so much faster, uh, we're able to. We've increased our yields. Uh, uh, that and the module builder is two of the greatest things that's happened in farming. And I'd like to say that uh, the days of holy cotton are gone. But unfortunately, we have weeds that are developing a resistance uh, to the, some of the modern herbicides we have today. And so a lot of farmers have gone back to hand hoeing to rid the fields of wheat. wheat. It's pretty expensive. But fortunately, we do have enough uh, herbicides out there that we're able to control the majority of the grass and weeds. When I was a kid, it took a lot of muscle power to farm. Today it takes brain power. You don't use your muscles near as much. Uh, Farming's a whole lot easier, but it's more complicated. A farmer has to have a lot of skills today. He needs to be like a chemist, accountant, lawyer, <laughs> just to name a few. You, know. uh, you don't just go out and throw your seed in the ground and come along and hold it anymore. There's just a, so much involved today. After farming for 30 years, I completely <coughs> retired. I turned everything over to my son-in-law. And, you know, I enjoyed farming. Uh, the last few years it's gotten a lot harder, but I enjoyed it. Uh, that's just something about being out there, tilling the soil. You know, by this time of year, most farmers are tired. Of it. They'll tell you, they're, they're ready for break. They're tired of it. But I guarantee you, next spring, they can't wait to get back out the field. And I'm the same way. I remember my first year, after my first year of farming, uh, Mr. Howard Newton stopped by. He said, Leon, I know you think you learned a lot this year, but it won't do you a bit good next year. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, it'll be completely different. And you know, he was kind of right. <laughs> uh, you know, every year is a different set of challenges. Uh, rain, not enough rain, insects, you, you name it, low prices. Uh, you worry about what the, the, the fire bill is going to be. You know, people in Washington have a lot to do uh, with whether farmers are successful or not. But, uh, even with all that, uh, I still miss it. I still watch the weather. I still look at crops and uh, think about things. And I watch the markets. 
I don't miss a stress. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm retired. <laughs> item in the patent system being what it was, it wasn't long before there were a lot of imitators, thieves, opportunists, whatever, and it was many years later before we actually got a patent on it. But that was the first modernization of ag, which created an opportunity to not just have cotton for the super rich for a few garments, it actually created cotton that could be exported to Europe where the fiber was replaced with land. That led to the improvement and, and development of the trade infrastructure, the freight system, but not without opportunists again. Uh, a lot of the folks in continental Europe didn't really think that this upstart country had any business being involved in the trade, and they saw fit to have what they called control measures, which translates into piracy on the high seas, to be sure that most of the material never got there. But then the War of 1812 took place, and we established the fact that we were a force to be recognized with. And following that, river trade really blossomed, river trade because of transportation issues. But the big problem, uh, as attested by the fact that almost all the development was right along the river, was uh, even less improved the road system than what we've heard mentioned here. Uh, that's why all your uh, plantation homes, et cetera, were either in the Delta area near New Orleans or along the river plants, uh, either Mississippi or later the top big beat over in the uh, border between Alabama and Mississippi. Pardon me. But during the early part of the 1800s, on up and leading to the Civil War, the agricultural system continued to improve. Better varieties, uh, better techniques, improvements not only in the cotton equipment, but the uh, reaper, which was uh, in 
prevented by Cyrus McCormick uh, of McCormick during translated into Farmo, am I correct? Yeah, made some improvements in grain harvest uh, as to what had been done in cotton production. Uh, then, as the uh, labor requirements really peaked, the issue of slavery rose to the forefront because it was such a controversial issue, but yet such an integral part of Delta A, it ended up in the Civil War or the war between the states. And for about 10 years, 1960 or, or 1860 to 1870, there was almost no agriculture in the Delta because the manpower was all involved in the battle. Uh, the, what river traffic there was was limited to war support or gunboats. Then about 1870, uh, operations began to resume, uh, improve varieties, better mechanization, uh, until by the end of that century, there were even a few petroleum-powered engines or power units as well as steam power units available. This was largely limited to either pump irrigation water or thrashing. Uh, and if you want to see some of this early stuff, take uh, the job of time on a Sunday afternoon and drive over to the museum in Stuttgart. They got a tremendous display of it. And on the way, you will still see two of the early irrigation engines laying on the east side of the highway as you drive up there. One of them still upright and in place, and one of them has been abandoned and is laying on the side. But these were used to support the rice industry there. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, it wasn't until the 1950s that rice swam across the river. Prior to that, rice in Arkansas was up on the prairie. But when it came, uh, it was a true godsend. And I'll get back to that in a moment. But then in the early 1900s, uh, we became intimately acquainted with both of them. And it continued to influence uh, several developments in ag. Uh, the sack dusting apparatus that uh, Jack mentioned, <laughs> and then uh, some of the more mechanized farms had hand powered blowers that were mounted on a saddle modification on a mule, where instead of having to walk in the wet cotton, you could ride the mule, crank the blower similar to a set of bicycle paddles. Still, you were using the same chemistry, though, the calcium arsenate, which isn't particularly favorable to long-term human health. <laughs> uh, it, it was also used, uh, in some cases, as a fertilizer, and it was used in early efforts at defoliation. So you got a triple exposure to it if you were involved in the cotton business. Uh, and that continued to be used up into the 50s. I can remember some of the early ag pilots applying. We had then called it Black Annie because it was almost like coal dust in its consistency but it remained in ag until then. But that in the Chelan nitrate of soda, that was the only fertilizer, was it until after World War II, and urea was developed uh, during the World War II period and became uh, a very inexpensive source of nitrogen following, and yields quickly blossomed as a result. But during the 30s, uh, mechanization began, began to come more and more to the front. And the way that we had addressed the shortage of fertilizers prior to that time was you just cleared some more land and went to farming it and abandoned what you had farmed and taken the fertility out of and allowed it to gully your road, uh, which didn't help uh, the runoff situation any whatsoever. Uh, that also led to the mouth of the Mississippi, if you will, moving further out in the Gulf because as all that silt went down and hit the ocean water, it stopped and settled out. So you can see the results of this even today if you happen to ride a, a cruise ship down the Mississippi out into the Gulf, you'll see these flat plains that are super rich because they've got our topsoil down there. I mean, we weren't the only ones. The folks up in the Midwest all the way up to the Great Lakes were equally involved in the same thing. But it wasn't until the 30s that any real efforts were made to address erosion, and that was triggered in large part by what you folks know as the dust storm, uh, which we were fortunately spared most of except some of the fallout but the creation of the Soil Conservation Service in the early 30s and efforts to address this continue to evolve today. That, that whole other story. But um, along the way, uh, improvements came, more and more mechanized uh, pieces of machinery showed up on the farm, uh, more precision in planting, uh, more precision in cultivation. Uh, although it was not until quite some time after World War II that true tractor power began to totally replace uh, the mule power that was, was in place. This created a second improvement, if you will, because as long as you were largely dependent upon mule power and so much hand labor, a large part of the output on the farm had to be dedicated to 
providing food for the manpower and the animal power. Once that you reduce the amount of labor required and reduce the amount of animals required, then you could look at having more of the production available for sale, which should help the bottom line. <coughs> and then World War II came and took away a lot of the manpower for a while. Those farms that did continue to operate quite often were with uh, moms and sisters and younger brother or some of the elderly folks left behind. But a lot of really positive chemistry and mechanical technology came as a result of World War II, which very quickly led to some great improvements in the farming equipment, the chemistry available, and the seeds that were available. Uh, and it was good because a lot of the population in the Delta chose to go northward to the factories for better paying jobs, better way of life, and more modern comforts, understandably so, but that left much less of a manpower pool here. <coughs> and in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, the Rural Electrification Act, as was mentioned here, truly took us out of the dark ages. It let us have running water, uh, indoor plumbing. Uh, I can truly remember seeing uh, a rare washing machine powered with a breeze and strap and gasoline motor. The first electricity I ever saw was Delco plant, as was mentioned here. And our first deep well used a, a gasoline pump. And then, uh, thank goodness, we can improve uh, much beyond that. But during the 60s, also, some uh, dedicated herbicides came on the market. Uh, the first one I remember that helped in the battle against grass was an item known as herbicidal oil, which was a highly refined kerosene or diesel fuel, which you were able to spray very carefully on cotton because cotton is a unique plant in that it has a thick outer skin called bark on the bottom for about that high on the ground. So you could side spray there and do a good job of wilting or discouraging the grass if the weather can keep you out. And then uh, Carmex came along, or Diuron. Um, then in the early 60s, Treflum, or Trifluron. And that allowed us to be proactive on the grasses in particular. Along this time, the tractors began to really proliferate uh, Again, we'll appreciate this day in the late 50s, got, or in the 50s, got where you started from the seat. And then uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, you could be inside with cab and air. Also combines. And every time I see one of these combines today create a dust storm, I am so appreciative, as I'm sure the operators are, for the cab and air or the enclosed machine, <coughs> because it was so beneficial to the health of the people. But I digress. Along in the very late 60s, foundation paperwork was laid for an organization that we today effectively know as EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency. Its concept was and is wonderful. Unfortunately, there is no mandate that it deal totally with scientific fact. And that's a whole other story. But in 1862, Rachel Carson saw fit to publish Silent Spring, which was her reaction and largely appropriate to concerns because a lot of the chemistry that we used in the 50s, but we didn't know any better, was not target specific. Aldrin, Indrin, and particularly Dildrin were horribly detrimental to human health. Uh, there was a saying among salespeople that the only good bugs are dead bugs. Well, that's not true. Probably 98% of the insecticide spectrum is beneficial. But it took us a while to get there, and it took prodding from people like Rachel and others to get us there. But Treflin being used as it was, and then rice coming in to let us farm the black land or the buckshot, led to wholesale clearing of a lot of land. Some of which we found out later maybe was better off when we still had trees on it. And I'll get to that in a moment. Then in the early 70s, chemistry folks came up with glyphosate, which soon was sold under the trade name Roundup. In 1980, it became the world's number one selling agri-chemical and remains there today. From the 80s until the mid-90s, you used it pre-emerge, or directed very carefully. The late 80s, to address 
red vine primarily. The Monsanto folks came up with a fall application program that you could use between harvest and frost, and it did away with eliminating the red vine, which was resistant almost all along chemistry. That, coupled with what the cotton breeders had done, allowed us to double the cotton acreage in the Delta in just a few short years. Prior to that, you had to grow cotton as a long season, 150-day crop on uh, good sandy loam or ice cream land. <coughs> Pardon me, they gave us cotton that was making 120 days, and it wouldn't make three bales on this buckshot, but it would make two bales on the ground that we can grow 20 bushels of soybeans. So you saw a proliferation of cotton gins, you saw a real proliferation and development in the cotton equipment. Pickers went from two row to four row to six row. The module builder and bowl buggies came along and replaced all those nightmarish ladies having to pull a trailer loaded with 30,000 pounds of cotton behind a two wheel drive pickup. It's nightmarish just to watch. I'm glad to see those days are, are gone. And today, as has been mentioned, we have the uh, pickers that have the old board module builder, which won't pick any faster, but you get an example. I know of Mr. Donahoe that bought three of them. He retired three conventional six row pickers. To support those three pickers, he had five module builders, four bowl buggies, a dispatcher called Ms. Donahoe, and <laughs> about 20 support people because the word was the cotton picker doesn't wait. He will be able to get, the, and the only source of those people are H2A visa workers or illegal wetbacks because you just can't go out and pick up people on the street corner as we could in the 50s, 60s. So, uh, no, he won't pick, he'll still only pick about 160 pounds a day per picker, but he will do it with so much less uh, concern with personnel. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. But in 1996, the Monsanto people and the seed companies that they either had bought or supporting came forth with another technology, and that being crops that are, quote, Roundup ready, which means you could spray the Roundup directly on the crop. It would eliminate the weeds, and the crop was fine. Cotton, soybeans, corn, canola, wheat, and alfalfa, and one other crop are under development. It very quickly took the world by storm. But the word was, you have your operation squeaky clean, and you put Roundup out there when it was the week a little bit. Well, as we're prone to do, we push the envelope, and push the envelope, and push the envelope, put it out too late, you put it out on stuff that's twice as high as it should be put out on. So we have had a proliferation, we're having a proliferation of weeds that are resistant. This is not the first resistance any of us have ever seen. I saw the first in the mid 60s to the rice crop and the herbicide. There was Roundup, I mean, there was ordinary grass that was tolerant, and propanil had only been on the market four years. But for the same reason, instead of putting it on little bitty grass like this, people put it on grass like this, the weeds have not changed. They are not genetic mutations. Please let me make that clear. In any species in nature, whether it's human, animal, plant, insect, whatever, there are a few specimens that don't follow the rules. You've all seen albinos. All the chemistry is the same except they're different. Well, in the case of the palmer amaranth, or pigweed, so-called because we used to turn pigs into the field after harvest and put an electric wire out because the plant is super rich in protein. It's a wonderful food source and if you could just keep it where you want it. That being said, a female palmer amaranth plant has up to 750,000 seeds. That's one plant. It's the only plant in normal circumstances that both male and female variant have viable seeds. The males have maybe 100,000. But it's also one of the few plants that doesn't die just because you cut it down to ground level. If it can see daylight, it'll come back. <laughs> Most folks, when they prepare turnovers or anything for harvest, they just go in and scrape it. Well, instead of growing up, the next time the little critter grows sideways about that high and makes a seed head about that long, it's just right for all manner of insects and birds to eat all fall. Mm -hmm. So if you have a plant in the field this year, you'll have a full density next year. In Deshay County, if you ride the highways, you almost don't see one south of the Winchester Kelso mm -hmm. Highway. 
this year. Last year, he didn't hardly say one south of the highway going from here to Watson. So don't be in denial, folks. <laughs> they're, they're here, and there are technologies affordable that if you use it, will keep them under control. If you don't, you be one of the club that is now in the hundred dollar plus an acre hoe hand club, because that's the average cost of a hoe hand operation once you let them get established. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. I guess the worst I've seen in Arkansas is up in the Widener area because of the unique topography of that land <coughs> and. <coughs> People were in denial for so long. They've got a lot of absentee landlords. Uh, people just didn't believe this is happening. But Monsanto is slowly ramping up to a very positive address on this. Their worldwide competitor, Bayer, or Bayer, B A Y E R, the German folks, uh, are very proactive and they are very simple. They say, whatever you're doing, we control wise this year. Don't do it next year. Change. Because what we did with Roundup, we used it over and over over and over. So that one in a million that was tolerant proliferated because all the competition was gone. Now we have a very high population of those that are tolerant. And sorry to get off in that mode, but I've been preaching that sermon for two years across the nation. But it's paying off. We're, we're getting some government help and some positive responses. Uh, <laughs> pardon me, but the later developments have already been mentioned here. In about 1980, we had a super hot, dry year, and that, I think, sealed the decision in people's minds to go from supplemental irrigation to truly irrigated agriculture. And it's a whole different cropping system. You plant different varieties, you plant different densities, you use different fertilizations, knowing that you're going to have the water out there if you need it. But that led from about 600 irrigation wells in Shane County in 1980 to 23, 2400 a day, plus the relapse. Uh, this has done two things. One, we've seen a major decline in the groundwater level. Uh, two, the water that's down there has got a much higher level of salinity or salt in it. Pumping salt water continuously in spots will reduce the fertility of the ground or sterilize it. And it also eats your equipment up. On the fish farm that I manage over near Arkansas City, uh, a well that's supposed to last 15 years will erode fall in the hole in three years. Paddle wheels in the fish ponds, unless they're stainless steel or super galvanized, in three years are junk. We've got two center pivots, and in three years we have to replace most of the plumbing on the center pivot because of salinity. There's ways to address this. The seed breeders have given us varieties that require much less irrigation. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, it took between four and five feet of water to make a rice crop. Today, if you're careful, you can do it 24 inches. Uh, we also used to put all the water in the top levee, and you've all heard the term cold water levee. Most of the damage you saw in that top levee wasn't cold water because rice is a 45 degree crop. It was salt being deposited in that top levee. Even back then, we had it. But as we reduce the overpressure by uh, drawing down the groundwater, salt water intrudes. This is just a natural phenomenon no solution other than just be very sparing. The seed breeders are also providing us with more and more either salt excluders or salt tolerant crops depending on whose type of breed. So I'm not preaching doom and gloom. But as was mentioned earlier, it's less and less and less muscle and more and more and more management to be successful. And it takes cubic money. That's <laughs> the place of agriculture continues to change. Thank you, folks.